Okay, so just over a year ago, uh, we um, had uh, our, our laser delivered. And because it, it, when I saw what SMILE represented, I, I was really struck how this was a major, major step forward. This was not just another iteration of you know, PRK, LASIK, and so on. This was real robotic, automated, intrastromal, no incision laser eye surgery. The sort of laser eye surgery you think of when you're watching Star Wars or uh, Star Trek, right? Um, I, this talk I give here and there, so there's a financial disclosure. I'm skinned. Um, <laughs> um, so what it stands for is small incision lenticule extraction. So it, it looks at the, the process as though the cornea is too powerful and we want to take out a lenticule from the stroma uh, of, the, of the cornea to make the patient then hematropic or make that eye hematropic. Um, and there's no flap and it's all uh, within the stroma. So the first cut, there's sort of basically one, two, three, four cuts. Um, the first cut, and this is carried out within the stroma. So it's like you've got a Jaffa cake, and all you want is the orange bit in the middle, but you don't want to disturb the biscuit, you don't want to disturb the chocolate, you just want to take out the, the juicy bit in the middle, but you want to leave everything like it's not being touched. So the laser cuts the refractive cut first. That's in the deepest part of the, of the, of the, of the stroma. Usually that might be about sort of 200 microns into the, into the cornea. And the contours, the shape, of that cut determine the refractive outcome. So that's where the numbers matter. The numbers we put into the machine uh, and the refraction of the patient is determined. The shape and the, sh uh, the length and so on, the size of that cut will determine how the refractive al alteration takes place. The next cut is two side cuts. Now remember this is in 3D, so this is a, a disc. This is a circle, so you can see it, it cuts up towards the epithelium. Uh, and then the, the third cut is the cap cut. And that is just the anterior part of the lens, right? And that just joins this part to this part. And it goes a little beyond it, as you'll see. And then the fourth cut is just a small nick, usually between two and four millimeters in length, through which this excess lenticule is removed, right? So the, the, this whole process is all within, within the, 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 the stroma of the cornea. The great advantage of this is that it doesn't cut the nerves and it doesn't cut the anterior stroma and all that's left intact. So by not cutting the nerves, the problem of dryness that you get with LASIK uh, is much less, much, much less. And because you're not removing, you're not cutting these fibers as you would if you were cutting a flap, you're, you're leaving the cornea in a much stronger uh, situation than, than otherwise. And we believe that we may be able to push the boundaries much further with, with, um, with smile as opposed to LASIK, which is where you cut the flap and, and lift it, because you leave the cornea basically so much uh, undisturbed. At the moment, we still use LASIK parameters about how much stroma you leave behind and so on, not because it's been found to be necessary, but just like that's where we've kicked off from. But those parameters have been pushed uh, further and further. So you wind up with this, this, this laser having cut this uh, lamella of, of excess uh, lenticule in the stroma, which is then removed. So let's have a look. This is the machine which you'll see and use shortly this after, uh, later this evening. Uh, the patient lies on this table. And what's very interesting is that it's the table that moves, not the, not the laser. So when we dock the patient onto the machine, we're using this joystick here. You twist it and they go up, you push it right, left, left, and so on. They, they go, and you use it to move the patient onto the laser head here. And it's really amazing how it's really like half a millimeter accurate. Um, you'll see yourself shortly. So the patient is, is lying on here. We move them on, onto the, the device. This curved, in, inside here you'll see there's a curved cup, and that just basically <coughs> kisses the eye. So it's, we maneuver it into place. You're going to maneuver it into place. You get it exactly on the, on the center of the visual axis, which is very easy to do. Uh, so you don't have any worries of eccentric um, 
fixation or anything like that. By definition, the patient is looking on the visual axis at the target, as you'll see shortly. As soon as it's docked, a little bit of suction holds the eye in place so the patient can't move, um, unless they really squeeze. But it hasn't happened yet to us, so it has been described. And while they're held in place, for about 27 seconds, the laser is delivered, and the whole procedure is basically done. Here it is. So here is, this ring is a reflection off the cornea of the ring of light that the patient is looking at. They're staring at the yellow dot. So we know that that is the visual axis. We get this ring concentric with it, and then you'll see the ring of contact. So now we have contact with the cornea. We get that in the middle. You're going to maneuver the pig's eye so that that ring of contact is right in the center. And then you'll see shortly, as the suction comes on, it holds the eye in place. This isn't a pig, this is a human, by the way. Um, there's the suction on, and then the, 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 you'll see now the refractive cut starting in a couple of seconds. Here it comes, so it's cutting that refractive cut we talked about, the deepest one, spiraling in. So now the patient says, it's, you can see it's a bit hazy. We then cut the outer one, you see the outer one, the ring, and now we're cutting the cap cut. So this is on the surface of, on, on the, in anterior to the, the deep cut, and there's a bit of overlap, and then there's the cut through which the lenticule will be removed shortly. So that's the whole thing done. All I've done is press a foot pedal. It's, it's, to it's totally robotic. Um, the, the trick is now to get the lenticule out. So this is what the eye looks like immediately afterwards. You can see the screen is a bit funny. Um, there's not, that's what, what really looks like. Um, so you can see here's the lenticule that's being defined by the laser, the e e exit incision, and the little rim of overlap. Um, you, we'll show you what to, how you do that. You, we then just dissect into this tunnel, free above and then below, uh, so that that lenticule is, is, uh, red, is separated from, it's kind of stuck like a postage stamp or a post-it note at this stage. And you, uh, you need to dissect it apart and then just pull it out. Now the next video, I think is one of the most beautiful things in surgery, is the lenticule coming out. And it really shows what the process is about. So I've dissected it, and here it comes. There it is. That, that's all that was making this patient minus six, right? About 0.001 of a gram of tissue was making them minus six. They're now planar, right? And it really is as, as dramatic as that. And we're just checking that we've got it all out. Obviously, you don't want to leave any, any parts behind. And done, finished, that's it. Now you think, oh, it looks a bit of a mess. Well, here is a patient, first day, less than 24 hours post-op, plano, you know, minus 0 0.1 vision. Um, and there's, you can see, when you look very carefully, you can see something at this stage. But basically, you can see nothing, and the patient sees everything. That's her post-op. This is the same patient pre-op. I mean, there really is nothing to see. There's no difference. It, it really is as atraumatic as that, and the, the, the excitement of, of, of seeing in, them in, in plan. So this is one week later. Uh, this is an OCT, a cross-section of the cornea. So you can see the endothelium. You can see the epithelium. That's, the, that's Bowman's layer there. And this here is the interface between, where the lenticule was removed. And that's one week post-op. And you can see that the residual stroma, in this case, is 367 microns, which is a lot of tissue. Basically, the cornea is, is as strong and as uh, healthy as it was beforehand. <clears throat> and again, the patient was um, plano with seeing 6665 on, on, on aided. Uh, this patient, I think, had been about minus 7 uh, preoperatively. Um, and then <clears throat> uh, this is a, a, a typical post-op case. This is a, a wavefront analyzer, which we'll show you shortly. And what it's looking at, this window here, is a representation of how 256 laser shots, uh, these, are not, these are tracking laser beams, are hand, how, that optic, how that is handled optically by the eye. And the, the closer they are together here, the more perfect the, the eye is optically. Now, 
nobody ever, even the most amazing jet fighter pilot, uh, is everything coming to the end. There's always a scatter. That's, that's the way it is for nature. And these numbers here represent the aberrations um, in, in, in the optical system, uh, the lower order and higher order aberrations. And you can, anything below 0, 0.0 something is very good. And in this post-op case, they're all way, way, way down. So the patient's vision is really excellent. The quality of it is excellent. This is the refraction, uh, which you, I think you'll agree uh, that it's a, an auto-refractor. It's basically nothing. Um, they're in the spectacle-free zone by, by quite a margin. And that's the sort of outcome we, we can expect. <coughs> um, so far, we haven't done a lot of cases because we're novice, we're new, and the laser arrived. We didn't know what to do. Um, patients came and saw us, uh, and we, we, we've treated them. Um, but the results have been um, e absolutely excellent. I mean, absolutely excellent. Uh, we've had no complications. None of the patients have lost any best acuity. They uh, all, of, when we say loss of best acuity, so let's say pre-op, on the best refraction, you could get them to six, five and a half, or six, six, four point five, something like that. They will still achieve that um, uh, post-op. What are your refractive parameters? For smile at the moment, it's from from zero, which is up to minus ten, but it will go up to minus fourteen. There, um, there are the, just the algorithm is being expanded slowly, but it, it's minus ten and five diopters of astigmatism. And plus, at the moment, smile is not done, doing commercially hyper -opes, but the research is being done on it, and they're treating, I know, I've talked to people who've treated plus eight with excellent results. Um, now that's early, and that's research, um, but it, there's no doubt it, it, will, it will roll out. There's, technically, there's no reason why hyper shouldn't be um, e effectively treated. How about the um, symptoms of glare and halos around lights? Is that... No, no. no. They basically... This gives patients normal vision. Um, it, 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 they, they, they have, um, the, sometimes in the old days, with the old lasers, with the flap and so on, or PRK, particularly if the treatment was decentered because the patient wasn't quite looking where they should have been looking, the machine had no way of knowing that, so it just blasted away. Um, if you had a decentration or if you had a small optical zone, light would be catching the edge, and the, the optical zones tend to end very abruptly. So you had this area on the edge, like a bevel's mirror, so you got all sorts of problems. So when the pupil opened up in the evening, the patient would start getting problems at night. This overcomes that by having a, a, usually a, a larger optical zone, and the, the blend between the treated and the untreated cornea is imperceptible. Um, so really, we've had no patients complain of glare, of dr even dryness. We have to remind them, please put your lubricants in. Please, you know, um, after a few months, they don't need any 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 medication at all. Yeah. Are there the same um, corneal thickness considerations? As at the moment, yes, uh, because we don't know what smile can do. So we still want a minimum of 250 micron stromal bed. So the gap between the refractive cut and the endothelium, we like to have. A minimum of 200, uh, 250 microns. And the amount that you remove, is that conducive to the refractive error? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. it's, it's determined by the refractive error. So if you, had, if you had a patient who was, say, minus 8, and let's say they had a corneal thickness of 510, you, you might, and they had a big pupil, like the pupil dilates up to 6, that could be a problem, because if you want to give them a 7 millimeter optical zone, you then will be using quite a lot of tissue up. So you may make it, and then you may make two decisions. You may make the optical zone smaller. You may move the lenticule further in. So instead of a cap thickness of 140 microns, you might make it even 90 microns. So you can move it 50 microns f further forward. So there's a lot of things you can do to try and skirt around that. But still, there are times when we say to a patient, no, your refractive error is too big to leave enough tissue safely. Uh, for you. And that is based on the 250 microns, but that we may find out over time 
is not a, a restraint in smile because the anterior stroma is left untouched. But we don't know that yet. It's only, smile has only been around just about a decade or so, so we need this for a bit longer. So is, that, that, is that the end of LASIK and PRK then? It's not. No, it's not the end of LASIK and, and PRK. PRK, they still have, a, they still have applications, but there's 99%, well, I'm overstating it, at least 90% of myopes will be best served with a smile than with a PRK or a LASIK. Um, the, the PRK is still, if you want to do a small treatment on a thin cornea, PRK may be best. Um, LASIK has some other advantages, which I'll come to in a, in, 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 shortly, uh, it, it, uh, about smile. But you'll see that it's probable that smile, the smile technology will supersede the flap, um, because it's just, it, it's just, I mean, you can, for me, when I look at that, me taking, that's me taking out the lenticule here, right? It so, seems so right. It just seems like, well, that's, that's that fixed. <laughs> Lifting a flap, putting on the eye tracker, uh, okay, that works and it's a great treatment and there's lots of people who have had brilliant vision permanently from LASIK with no complications at all. Absolutely, definitely correct. But I think smile is another step in the right direction towards safety and, and acceptability and small incision and so on. Um, okay, so, um, and all the patients are, you know, the dry eye, the glare, all that, we just, we just haven't seen it, you know. Um, okay, so we're gonna, that's smile, but the other trick the machine can do is it can cut a flap. And one of the, one of the areas where we find it very uh, effective, and I was talking to you, a couple of you earlier, um, you may or may not know, we, we've stopped doing multifocal implants here um, for patients with cataract or lens replacement surgery. And the reason for that is I've, I was never greatly convinced that it was great technology. I put in a lot and kind of many patients were thrilled, and many patients were not thrilled, and some patients were disappointed. And, um, and also there was the marketing side of things where you promote, you're, you're selling something extra you're saying it's not available on the NHS, and, and then you're delivering something that can be disappointing. And that, on a marketing level, is not great. As a clinician, it's not good either. You, you're, you're, you're looking at something and thinking, if this technology worked, wouldn't Mother Nature have given us a multifocal lens and not bother with accommodation, and then so on. But, so, so we've stopped doing multifocals. So for patients who want to be in, who presbyopes, who want to be independent glasses, we're offering this Presbyond. So Presbyond is a LASIK-based treatment. So we lift a flap and do an eczymer laser treatment. Which you, I'll explain that shortly. I don't want, I don't want to go on too long. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and it induces, it works by inducing a specific amount of spherical aberration. Because it's been found that spherical aberration can be used by the brain to increase the depth of field. So what appears to be in focus, what is actually in focus, is a much greater depth. And if you then blend it between the two eyes, with a little bit of minus on the non-dominant and plano in the, in the, dom in the dominant eye, that, that overlap of those two depths of field gives the patient near intermediate and distance vision uh, w without any, any effort at all. Um, but it, it's still based on inducing spherical aberration, which currently we can only have the technology to do using an eczymer laser having lifted the corneal flap. So let's just look at that. Um, so it's, as I said, it's, uh, we lift the flap, um, and it's, uh, I've said all that, and, uh, and I've said all that. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, I've said that. <laughs> okay, here's the flap, right? So here's the patient looking up at the fixation light, you can see that ring, that's a guide for me, and then you'll see the contact with the tear foam, there it is, make sure it's exactly in the middle, and, and, and then you see the suction come on uh, shortly, the patient blink there, um, and uh, get it exactly concentric, then I hit the button for the vacuum, and you'll see it go uh, about, about, come on, but there. Right? So now, now you'll see the, the, the flap being cut. So you'll see, um, I think I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Um, I should edit this, shouldn't I? Uh, here we go. So you can see, this, it's much bigger 
and it's just one cut. It's just one cut. And then there's the rim cut, which you'll see shortly here, around, all around the outside, except here. Right? So now you can see we have this flap of cornea that we can lift up, hinged on this portion here. So now we can access the stroma. Um, so the, this is cut on the same laser, the femtosecond laser. And this table then rotates around to this laser, which is the Xyma laser. Uh, and then this is where I've lifted the flap. And now the patient has to fixate. And this is where the tracker is needed, because if the patients move, the tracker will stop the, the treatment. This patient was four diopters of cylinder. So you can see most of the treatment is here on the flat axis, trying to make it the same contour as the, um, the steep axis. And this is normally about 9, 10, maybe 20 seconds of treatment. Now, I'm protecting the flap from any stray shots. And then the flap goes back. And it's quite handy that it sticks back very easily, because the uh, surface tension on the endothelium is pumping out the fluid and just sucking it, the thing back onto the, um, uh, the, back onto the cornea. Um, and then a good wash, make sure there's no debris uh, underneath. And it's, it's there. And the patients see it pretty well straight away. Um, <coughs> basically, it's doing the same thing as SMILE. It's removing a lenticule of tissue. But it's doing it by exposing it and then vaporizing it. Um, and you, you've cut all the nerves. You've cut all the anterior stromal fibers and so on. Um, it's fine. It, you know, it's a great treatment. Millions of patients have had LASIK without any problems at all. If smile disappeared, LASIK would still be there uh, doing great, great work. Okay. Now, afterwards, there's three phases of healing. There's the immediate pain in the flap. There's a remodeling of the epithelium. That takes a few weeks, and that's probably where the spherical aberration is induced. Is the changes in the epithelium in response to the changes of the contour. Of, of the endothelium, of the stroma underneath. And then the brain uses the, to, uses the spheric aberration. And that algorithm is already there because w our brains are designed to look through an optically imperfect eye. We, we all know no eye, no matter who, whose it is, 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 is perfect. It's not, you, know, you compare the optics of the human eye with a Canon lens. The Canon lens optically is far superior. Uh, in all sorts of measures. But the human eye sees better because it's 20% is optics, but 80% is data processing. So I don't know if you know about the Hubble telescope, how the mirror was built wrong. And when they, they, they discovered it, but they didn't have to change the mirror, they just changed the software. And if you look at the images from the Hubble telescope, they're ast astonishing. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just how the same thing in our brain, it doesn't have to be a perfect optical image, the brain can make use of and it's not that the patient tolerates the blur. The blur is taken out by the software, and the patient sees perfectly clearly. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up yeah. there. Yeah. Th these, these patients um, really do see very well. Um, and it's tempting, I must say, to, to, to when I get my reading glass, I think I should have pressed me on done. The only thing that puts me off is, is the flap. But, but patients who've had it, really are a drive, supermarket, tele telephone, watch, emails, texts, all without any glasses at all. Um, and in their 60s, 70s. And in their 60s and 70s. And um, the, the chap, the one I showed you there was a guy who'd already had his, he came with cataract, and he wanted to be independent of glasses, so he had his cataracts done. Three months later, we went back and did the, um, the, uh, the, the, the presbyte. And um, mm -hmm. it, it really, it's very exciting. I know five active practicing ophthalmic surgeons who've had presbyond. Yep. And two of them in a practice in London, and they did it on each other. So it wasn't anybody. It wasn't had a good success rate. It, it has a very good success rate, but the preoperative assessment is very detailed. It, it, and and, and the, the, a very significant part of it is making sure that the brain can tolerate the cross blur between the, the two eyes. And most people can, but obviously some people can't, and then you wouldn't, you wouldn't offer them uh, a presbyon. But the, it, it's a lot of time. It's at least two hours pre-op assessment. 
with a specialist optometrist. Um, and when I say specialist, it's someone, the, the numbers we put in the machine are not the numbers in the spectacle prescription. They're slightly different. They're usually very similar, but they're slightly different. So you might not give the full sill for very good professional reasons, you know, but in this, you probably would treat the full sill because it'll just come back and bite you if you don't. And sometimes you might keep, treat an extra 10% of the sphere uh, for, for one reason or another. So it's not, uh, when I say a specialist optometrist, it's somebody who's, who's done the training for that type of optometric work. Um, and uh, it, it, so we don't just sort of take your glasses, put them on the consumer and tap it into the machine and say, jump on there, we'll fix it for you now. It's not, it's not, like, it's not like that. 